Brian. Hello. Okay. Um, hey everybody, my name is Albert Chang. Uh, thanks for coming, and uh, I'm really excited because uh, for many reasons, uh, one of which is that this is the biggest turnout, and it's like one after the other meetup. There's more and more of a turnout. Um, and I'm really excited because of Simon being here. I've had an inter interest in React, and I think it's kind of growing on many people that I meet. I'll bet you a number of you guys here have some sort of interest, if not already delving into it. Um, and um, so, yeah, um, Simon's been gracious enough to come down here from um, the Menlo Park Facebook campus and uh, uh, give us his um, his spiel on React. Can I ask actually how many people here are new to JS? Like how many people have either done very little or none? Just raise your hand. Or... Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I think it's no, good to kind of see. Uh, how many people here have some sort of experience with ES6, uh, ECMAScript sy syntax? Okay, so a decent amount, looks like kind of 40%-ish. Okay. Um, and how many people have worked with React before? <coughs> oh, good. <laughs> good so I guess we're small. There you go. Segway it over to you. Um, All right. Yeah. Thanks, Albert. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for having me out here. I'll just, um, uh, what I'm looking to do is maybe 20 minutes of slides. And, uh, it may turn out to be a little bit less, and then we'll just jump into some code for 20 minutes, and uh, we'll take some questions. Actually, what I'll do is I'll, I'll pause at one point during the slides to take some questions, and then I'll pause again after we're done with the slides and before we jump into the code. And then with the code, we can kind of do some interactive stuff. So um, I, I didn't know what to expect with regards to where everybody's level is going to be at, so I so I took it pretty basic. And um, and then if somebody has some kind of more advanced questions that you want to ask, we can, we can kind of see how that goes when we jump into the code a little bit. Uh, so. So yeah, we're just gonna. So thanks to Albert and thanks for you guys for having me out here. We'll just um, we'll just get started here. So I'm Simon. I work at Facebook. Uh, I do I do not work on the React core team. I um, I, but I work with React. So I work on the ads team. We build most of our ads interfaces in React. Actually, I think that's where React started was in ads because the ads interfaces get pretty complex. Uh, and by that I mean the interfaces that advertisers use to create their ads and, and target their ads. So. Um, and find me on Twitter at the end. I'll um, put that up again. But I will um, I'll tweet my uh, the link to the slide deck and um, and the example code. So uh, right. So React. So the the thing about building is in React is that once you figure it out, it, it once it kind of clicks, you realize how much it changes the way you build uh, UIs. So th this is a comment uh, you hear all the time, and it's really simple to that. It's like building React. Building React feels a little like cheating. Um, and once you build your first project in React, I think you'll kind of get that feeling as well. So before we jump in, I'll just um, I'll just touch on ES6. As Albert mentioned, most of my examples are going to have a little bit of ES6 syntax kind of sprinkled in. So this is just the next version of JavaScript, and a lot of us are using it today um, by using something like Babel, which just compiles it down into normal JavaScript so that you can use kind of some of the syntactic sugar, so to speak. So uh, there's template strings. So, so the key things that that we use regularly are template strings, arrow functions, and destructuring assignment. Um, even though there's tons of more great stuff, if you get the chance to get into ES6. So I'll just uh, so template strings are really simple. They're just instead of, concatenate, instead of breaking strings into chunks and concatenating it with variables using plus signs, you just uh, drop um, your variables into the into the string. So your string needs to use backticks, and you just drop variables in using a dollar sign and, and curly braces. And the other big advantage is that you can do multi-line strings with um, with template strings. So th that's really helpful for when you're, you know, if you're working with markup or if you're, um, you know, working with blocks of text that need to break lines. The other thing is arrow functions. So arrow functions is just a shorthand for for writing out the the keyword function. Um, it also uh, you can do one-liners with it. Um, and then the important thing is that it, it auto binds this, so it binds the function to the context that you're in, so that you don't have to do var self equals this and then run the self throughout your function. So it's um, again, it's it's syntactic sugar, so it just makes you have to write less code, but it, it flows really nicely. It, it makes the code a little more elegant. So um, does everybody kind of understand this? Does that make sense? So if you see this arrow function, does anyone not have uh, like not is understand it, callbacks? Is, is there a way to bind with that to something else? No. No, it's meant to be a lightweight function, so it's actually going to be lighter weight than calling bind and using a full function when the browsers support it. And right now, only Firefox supports it. So that's why we compile down. Um, and then destructuring assignment 
is, is really cool because um, that probably looks the weirdest to everybody, but what it is is it's, it's making multiple var declarations that uh, destructure the thing you're assigning it from. That's a bad explanation. Basically what it means is it takes an object and um, it pulls properties off of it and puts it into local variables, just, just for convenience. So um, the top one is, is equivalent to the bottom one, which the bottom one is longer. And, um, and th the real value is that when the thing on the right, instead of just being a static like React, is, is actually a function call. So you can take the return value of a function call and restructure it. Uh, okay, so that's enough about ES6, so um, on to uh, React. So React is uh, a really fresh way to build your UI. So it, it, it's, it's pretty different than most other ways of describing your views, I think. Um, you know, one thing that a lot of people sort of criticize about it is that, you know, it isn't a drop-in replacement for a full MVC framework. In fact, it's just the V out of an MVC. Uh, there are other things that you can bolt onto React to get your um, your models and your controllers, but the, but React in and of itself as a library is a small API that provides the view. I mean, you can really learn the API in a day. There's not a lot of method calls to it, um, methods and, and uh, things. The it, it is essentially it's an oversimplification to say this, but it is an abstraction over the browser DOM. So if you should never have to call add class, remove class, hide, show. Um, you know, add a node, things like that. You, you, should you should never have to touch the DOM if you're using React. If you find yourself using React and you're also doing DOM methods, then you're doing something wrong and, and you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't really be doing that. Um, now, why is React different? React, if you think about it in its pure sense, is a pure function that you can pass to a data and it returns to a view. And by pure function, I mean that if you give it the same data, it will always give you the exact same view. There's no side effects. There's no state um, internally that would that should um, that should uh, change the result. So it's in indefinite, essentially. Um, it is declarative in that you declare. So the idea behind declarative is that you declare what your view should look like at any given point in time. You don't declare how to get there. So you don't say, hey, add this class to this thing or move this thing down. You just say where it should be on the page and React figures out how to get it from where it is now to where it should be. Um, and then compositional is really important because it allows you to compose more complex UI components from much smaller, very simple components. So that's actually a, one of the core strengths of this. And so you'll notice I didn't mention performance. And I think the reason is, is because performance is not a fundamental thing about why React is different or good. It's more like a side effect of some of these things. Um, there are awesome talks about kick-ass performance that React offers, but this, you know, I don't think that's part of this talk. Uh, okay, so if, if there's one slide that you remember today, it should be this one. So uh, you can think of the way React, React works in this very oversimplified way. So um, the first thing you'll notice is that, that that's a template string at the top. That's uh, It's a back take, and then we have line breaks in there and some HTML code, and then we have that dollar sign um, brace interpolation syntax there. <coughs> But essentially, this is the way React works. So you have a render function that's a pure render function, and you pass it data, and it passes you a view. And it gives you back a view, I should say, from that data. Um, and then you can just set the inner HTML of some of your document to the result of this function call and pass it your data. Um, the way you would write this in React is, is pretty simple. Does everybody kind of understand what we're doing here? Everybody on board? So, um, so this, is, this is React in a nutshell. Um, the way you would do that in React is, is this simple. You would do, you would create a React class, you would have a render method that returns almost exactly what we returned from our template string, and then you would call react.render, you'd pass some data, in this case, name equals Santa Cruz, and then you would render it to your body. Um, so I mean, I know what you're thinking, that this is just a more complicated way of doing this, and why wouldn't we just do this, right? But it, it gets a lot more powerful. And, and the first thing you'll notice here is that the um, the syntax, so, so we have this JSX syntax, which, which looks like XML or HTML just like chucked into our JavaScript, and there's no string around that, right? That's actual uh, XML looking stuff inside our JavaScript. And that's called JSX. <clears throat> and it's completely optional. You don't have to use JSX, but, you, but you'll find that it's really cool. Um, I think you'll find, most people who do React find that it's really cool when you, um, when you start using it. And um, and so so I'll get on a side note of JSX really quickly, and I'll say that JSX is not exactly a templating language. It's just it, it's more syntactic sugar on your JavaScript. So this view that we're looking at, um, 
is it desugars essentially, transforms down to this JavaScript that you see below here, which is element equals react.create element, pass in a, a class called view, uh, which react class is component one. Mm -hmm. So you pass in a component called view, and then you pass in some data. Now, um, it's shorter to do the top one, but it also is, is very powerful when you build, start building more complex stuff. Now, I know that we've spent years getting away from XML, and, and I don't want to give you the impression that this is putting XML in our JavaScript, um, although it looks similar to it. What it is, is it's just a way of describing our views in a way that, that, that works really well for us, because um, we think of, <coughs> as web developers, we think of views in terms of HTML and in terms of, um, uh, you know, open tags and closed tags and, and attributes and things. So, I won't spend too much time on this, but I will say that it's totally optional, you can do the bottom one. I, all my examples are gonna be in the top method, in, in the top format here, because that's how most people who use React do it. And there's and there's some cool stuff you can do with it. So, um, now going back to, so this is the most code you'll see on any slide. So sorry about how much code is on the, on the slide here. Can everybody see? Um, this is, this is an example of, of, so if we take our previous React example and, and we add state to it. So this had props, and, or, or properties, as you might want to call them. They, properties are how you get data from the outside world, so from the, the bottom line here, um, into your component. And you don't have to pass just strings. You'll see a format later how you can pass numbers and you can pass functions and you can pass anything you want, any values you like. Uh, but this is just kind of half the story. The other half of the story is internal state, so you need to keep track of things internally. And that's where um, this more complicated example comes in. So here what we're doing is we're creating a counter that just has a button and a paragraph. And the paragraph is gonna tell us how many times we've clicked the button so far, and the, uh, and, and the button will uh, cause an action that changes our internal state. Um, now we're also still passing in a prop from the outside world, which is the button label. And when we render that to the document, we uh, the, the very first time we mount the component, we're gonna get um, an initial state, which is that top <coughs> method right there. And we're gonna start at the count of zero. And then as you uh, as you click on the button, you're uh, you're gonna call this bottom method, the on click method. And that's gonna set that's gonna call a method called set state, which just changes the count to what the current count is plus one. Um, there's a couple things I'll explain. Um, I guess I'll give you a second to kind of see if you can wrap your head around this because that is a bit of code. But the um, the important thing to note is that we attach our event handler within the render method, which may seem really weird because I know we spent a lot of years in the JavaScript world getting away from inline <laughs> code in our HTML and in our mockup. But th but there's a good reason why we do that, and um, it doesn't violate separation of concerns as much as you might think, because really the concern of this entire counter class is view. And part of the view is describing um, how to change the view when something happens. And, and when you get into advanced React, you move this stuff out into different files anyway. But the point is, um, it calls the onclick method, which, all, which, which does not just say this dot state dot count plus plus, right? And there's a reason for that. We need, anytime we change state, because state should essentially be immutable, anytime we change state, we call a set state method, which gives us a new state. And that tells React that uh, something's changed, I might need a re-render. So those are the important parts of this. And you know what, I might as well show you a, a quick example of what this looks like, and then we'll um, stop there and take a, uh, take a question. Does somebody have a question about that that you wanna throw at me right now? While I'm just dragging this over into the right place. I have a, I have a quick question. Um, who here has done Angular? and they're familiar with directives. <clears throat> okay, cool. I only ask that because to me, there is a, fam there is a sense of familiar familiarity here where we're talking about directives and how we can pass through properties and have that on the scope of those directives um, and how each of the directives are just components. So that's just me. So uh, this is what renders there. We'll go back to the slides in a minute. I'll make it a little bigger. Um, it's exactly what I described to you. You click the button and it changes the internal state. And when internal cha state changes, React knows, hey, um, hey, I need a re-render. Now, um, remember how I showed you that example and I said if there's one slide you remember, it's that, um, it's that this is how React works. So you can imagine this as if I clicked a button, 
which called a method which changes my state data, and then my state data calls my render method, which gives me a brand new set of HTML, and then we blew away the whole document and put that HTML in its place. And although that's not how it works because of a lot of optimizations and stuff, that's how you can think of it. And that's how you probably should think about your views, is that when data changes, um, your entire view goes away and a new view gets generated, right? Now internally we have virtual DOMs and we have a dipping mechanism and everything so that, for instance, if you click on a drop-down menu and you're hovering some item, that it doesn't blow away the whole DOM and recreate it, right? Um, but, but that's basically the idea. So does everybody kind of understand, let me go back to that code real quick. Um, does everybody sort of understand uh, this slide? Or do we have some questions about that? Hey, what, one question. Okay. Um, I understand how you have the on-click uh, as a React handler, but what if you were using something else like, uh, say, a, a tap event from some other library or something? Uh, I have heard that maybe it is best not to add these kind of handlers in the render method, but to do it on component event mount or something. Yeah. Do you have any opinion about that? Yeah, so when you're crossing the boundary between a React world and something that lives outside of the React world, you have to do exactly that. Um, and it's because, you know, in React we have built-in stuff for all the HTML things like buttons and keys and divs, as well as other things that kind of, um, gloss over all the browser inconsistencies and, and um, help us with inputs and text areas and complicated things. But if you're, let's say, using an external component like a um, like a tiny MCE editor or something, uh, then it's not going to have these. Uh, you know, it's not going to accept props like that. So you have to build a wrapper around that. You have to use on component mount and you have to mutate things manually. But the idea is that um, anybody that once you create that React wrapper, anybody using consuming that, you know, another developer on your team or you in other places would just use these kind of methods. So yeah, you have to build that bridge. Okay. Right. So um, so this is the this is the biggest slide. So it's it's actually if you can understand this, you've got almost all of React. Like I said, it's a pretty small API. It's not much. There's not much more involved besides this. Uh, the one other thing that I want to go over with you is composition. So composition is a way of saying that one component is built out of one or more other components. Uh, it's composed of, so in this case, big button is composed of button. The important thing to note here um, is that I introduced a new syntax. So now you've got this XML-like uh, construct in your render function. And now I've introduced uh, this dot, dot, dot um, within curly brackets. And what that means is that means take all of the props on, on my props, if I'm big button, take all of my this.props props um, and pass them straight through to my um, to my button that I'm rendering. Except add one more, add a class name, and call it big. So this is how I would compose a button and make a big button out of it. The I guess the thing to note here is that we're not taking a div called big button and rendering another div inside of it called button, right? We're actually only rendering one button, one element. But we are composing it into, um, we're putting one layer of abstraction above it, which accepts, um, generally the, the use case for this is accepting uh, some sort of defaults, accepting some sort of options, um, computing something, and then rendering it. I don't know if I did that justice in explaining it, but that is, the idea behind it is that you can take, you know, and, and, and I, I didn't put up here the implementation of button, but you, you know, you can kind of <clears throat> assume Previously, a button has an on-click and it has a, you know, um, a a label and various different things. But I guess the thing I want you to take home from this is that you can um, wrap components in components in components, and it does not um, it is not heavy to do so in that it doesn't add tons of browser layers of stuff. Right? It, it really just allows you to, to layer functionality on. Uh, okay, so that's um, so that's kind of my presentation. So we can we can kind of build some code now. I think um, I think I want to show you two examples that I that I sort of threw together this afternoon. I actually I was with Albert and, and we did this. Um, we did I think after after I put this presentation presentation together, we did these examples in an hour. So you know it doesn't take too long to build this basic stuff up quickly. Hold on, thank you. Let's try this. <clears throat> oh, you can't see me anyway. You know what, this is gonna be a little tricky if I have to um, look that way and use the keyboard here, so I'm you gonna- You can do it here. You can I think I'm gonna do that, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good call. Okay.
so I'll blow this up as I open an example so that you can see. Uh, the first thing that we'll do, uh, so we saw that we saw the counter example. That's a it's a really good example of. Oops. Does that does that work for everybody size wise? Can everybody sort of read that? Okay. I'm gonna scoot this. Um, so we saw this counter example. Um, this uses props. It has a event handler and it uses state. So I, I, I want to take this one step further, and we will look we'll at this, this this clock example. And so if you ignore, so let's go a little further. So if you ignore this helper function at the top, which is just um, adds a zero to a number that's only one digit, just for display reasons. Um, and you look at our uh, our clock class. Uh, we're gonna have some internal state. So we want to we want to just store the hours, the minutes, and the seconds. And we'll, and we'll start at zero for all of them. Now you'll notice two new things. So we've got a component did mount and a component will unmount. These are built-in methods. They are uh, the first one is called whenever the React render inserts it into the page, and the second one when it removes it from the page. When we insert it into the page, we want to do two things. We want to set a, a, a timeout interval so that every one second we, uh, we call a method, and that method's going to be update time. And then uh, we also want to go ahead and call that method now rather than just waiting a second for that to happen. So, so that's what we're going to do when it, when, it, in, when it goes into the DOM. Uh, the other thing is when we leave the DOM, you'll notice that I added this uh, timeout just on my disk method. Um, it's just a, a reasonable place to just store some some temporary variable that I need again when I unmount. Uh, we'll go ahead and clear the timeout so that we're not still trying to call a method after we've unmounted. So those are those are pretty standard boilerplate. Um, if, if you know this code part should be a little bit more interactive. So you know if you guys want to jump in or, or ask me a question or something, feel free to. So I don't want to kind of babble up here over the top of everybody's head and then you didn't get anything out of it. But um, so our render method is pretty straightforward, just like we've seen before. We've got some JSX in there, which is a div. Um, we've got a title that says the time is, and then we've got our heading, and then we've got some um, some spans, which have our hours, followed by uh, a colon, and then our minutes and our seconds. So that's pretty straightforward. The update time function is really where things happen. And that's if, that's called, if you remember, we schedule that to, uh, up here in the component did mount. We schedule that to be called every uh, one second, every 1,000 milliseconds. And so what that does is that creates a new date. It's, it calls set state with the date dot get hours, the date dot, dot get minutes, and get seconds. And then it pads all of them just to make sure that we don't have a one digit because it looks a little wonky with a one digit in minutes or seconds. Uh, and then now, uh, now that we've defined our class, let's go ahead and render it into the document. So that's, um, does everybody, everybody follow me on that? I'm curious why, um, I, I'm assuming that class name gets built down to this class, and I'm curious why you, um, when you're building the JSX there, yeah. why, why you use, why they have to do class That's names? That's a just great class. question, and I, I'm so used to seeing class name that I didn't even think that that looked weird, but yeah, of course that looks weird to you. If you're, if you're thinking of this as HTML and you see this class name stuff, um, it, it has to do with a reserved word in JavaScript class. Um, it turns out that in newer JavaScript, we don't have that reserved word problem because um, you're allowed you're allowed to use reserved words as property accessors now. But when um, at the time when React was written, you couldn't do that. And so there's a number of there's a number of properties that are like that. And if you go to um, here, uh, this is a handy HTML to JSX compiler that's written by Facebook, um, and that is. Um, and what that does is that does that automated version if you have some HTML and it turns class uh, over here into class name over here, as well as a few others. Like four is also a reserved word in JavaScript, so four becomes over here HTML four. Okay. Just these weird things that happened before I ever got into React. So there's a few exceptions, and that's the only one that you'll probably see often. Um, 
Oh, the other thing that you will see is this input here on the left. So it's perfectly valid HTML to do that, right? An input that doesn't have this self-closing part in JSX, that is not valid. So in JSX over here on the right, you'll see that automatically adds up. Those are the only differences that I can think of off the top of my head. JSX is kind of a superset of, of or a subset of uh, HTML, kind of. And the reason why I say kind of is because you build your own components as well. Um, and an example of that would be this clock component. Uh, it is not just convention, but it's actually required that when you build your own classes that they start with a capital letter. And the reason for that is, is that now React knows that that is not an, some built-in browser element. That is an element you created and you, you need to define that somewhere. And if you didn't define it, you need to throw it out. <clears throat> um, so, did, so, does this, so does this code make sense? Any other questions? Okay. So I'll just, I'll just bring that up over here. So this is probably exactly what you can see. Um, I don't think I'm going to <coughs> mind here. But, but what we could do is we could do something really cool. Um, since we're trying to do an interact, some interactive coding here, um, why don't we add a button to this that pauses the clock, right? That might be useful. So I think the, the, the easiest way to do this is let's just add a button in our render. <coughs> And you'll see, on a side note, you'll see that this um, IDE, which I'm using WebStorm, which is an awesome IDE, so this understands JSX mixed in with my JavaScript, right? Uh, it's a really cool thing that, that uh, I think it's a plugin that, um, that they created, that JetBrains created, so that you can use these features, because it would be really ugly if, uh, if we didn't have all our code coloring and formatting there. But that, that's one cool thing about React being kind of so mainstream there. Uh, so, so we'll add an on-click. And we'll call it um, right, and then in our button we'll say so we want to implement this this toggle pause button, and uh, the one thing that we'll do is that we need to create another another state. Uh, property called is paused. So I'll just add it here. Actually, let's start in the pause state. Um, I also should factor this out into a method called start timer, start clock. So that when the uh, component mounts, we start the clock. And when the component unmounts, we stop the clock. So um, I'll come down here. We still haven't written our toggle pause yet. And we should create a start clock. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got three methods, right? The stop clock is easy. We've already got the code for that right there, right? Um, the start clock, we also have the code um, right here, <coughs> right? Because essentially that's what we had before in the component mounted and component uh, unmount. And then, so to toggle pause, what we really want to do is we want to set state, right? Um, and the state we want to set is is pause, and we want to set it to whatever the opposite of this dot state dot start pause. Um, and then we actually <coughs> need to okay. So, it, so we're going to grab the current state is paused. We're going to set the state to the opposite of whatever it is. And then we'll say if, you know what, we'll move that set state. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll explain this. So, um, so if we are currently paused, we want to start clock. Otherwise, we want to stop clock. And then let's move. 
taste a lot to me. Set the clock. We want to change the pause to pulse, and then stop the clock. True. Well, that makes sense. Everybody. It first, but remember oh. on the component, we actually called the start. Yeah. Um, so realistically, this value here would make no difference. So we could have it all right. Uh, so we'll pause the clock. We'll pause. And we'll start it again. So. Do you have to do anything to get the in browser JSX transform anymore? I do, yeah. So, um, so I cheated a little bit. And I use the development mode, which we just view this source. Uh, you can see that I included this JSX transformer, and then I included that um, funky type attribute on my script tag. Uh, so that's that's doing some, it, you know, it's waiting for document onload, and then it's looking through the document for scripts that have this type, and then it's fetching that data and, and doing all this stuff. But um, it, it's good for demos. In a production app, you would not do that. What you would do is you'd use a build process like a um, like a browserify or like a Webpack or something, and you would. Uh, and, and you kind of every time you, you can set it up in your you know IDs so every time you save the document it kind of just does this whole process cool. and, and transforms it. But this is a cool way to. Uh, I mean, you can see how simple the, the you know there's nothing there, right? And the code itself is, is not really huge. So it it really does let you produce things that would be rather complex. Uh, otherwise, you know what? This isn't a super complex example, but you know there are there like the next one I'll show you here would be pretty complex to do without um, without new state, without it managing my state and my life cycle, my mount, my unmount stuff. So, uh, so we'll the next one we'll look at is the is this contacts demo. Do we have any other questions before I move on? I do, but you can ask them. So if I put a, let's put a debugger in my toggle pause. <clears throat> you know what we should what we should do actually do here is we should display this text based on whether it's currently paused or not. So it should say pause or resume. So a, a good way to do that before I get too off track here is we would say so um, I can switch back by using these these brackets. I can switch back to the JavaScript now and I can say um, uh, this dot state dot is paused. And I want this text, otherwise I want this text. Is everybody familiar with the ternary operator with the question mark like that? So if it's paused, then I want to say resume. And if not, I want to say pause, right? So um, <coughs> that makes more sense, right? Um, that was totally off, off topic of your question. So your question is- Can you use that for the class name? <coughs> Sorry, go ahead. Can you use that for the class name as well? Like if it was paused, do it in red, and if it's running, do it in green or something like that? Totally. Okay. You can totally do that. Anyway, anytime you break into this um, using these curly brackets, you're in JavaScript land and you can do anything you want. Um, you, you can insert any expression you want. Okay. If that makes sense. Okay. Uh, so let, let's add a, a debugger here um, right after this is paused. So uh, if, if I refresh this uh, and I press pause, so we've now gone into our debugger. And you can see that uh, our, oh, because it source mapped it for us. That's beautiful. So because it source mapped it for us, we're actually seeing this ES6 syntax. Can you tell can you see can you tell where the ES6 is here? It's this um, we didn't mention the word function here. So ES6 shorthand function is just the name of the function uh, of the method and then <coughs> parentheses. So we can kind of use a shorthand there. And because of our source maps, our debugger actually lets us see our <coughs> original source. You can see the same thing here, right? This is all our Untranspiled source, which is really cool. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. So just view the view the state of the view state inside of functions. Um, what is your question? If we wanted to see the value of this variable? Yeah. 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 So just set inside of functions. Yeah. So here you can you can see that. 
I don't know why when I first was going through the tutorial, I was trying to set it and set it. I was trying to stop things and set up the data edge or something. Yeah, I mean, you certainly can. And, and I think um, we're, we're reaping some benefits here of Chrome uh, doing some really advanced stuff with source maps to understand our original source code and line numbers and everything. Uh, so so that's, that's pretty recent and awesome stuff. Uh, when I started with it, the source that I would, be, that I would see in my debugging console here would be the, the compiled source. But it wasn't that ugly. It's, it's pretty straightforward. You can totally tell what's what. Um, right, so we'll... Yeah, we'll remove this and, and kind of move on to this other example. Uh, right, so I wanted to do this. Should, should we show the, the result first and then look at the code? That might make more sense. So I want to do this contacts uh, example where it filters a list of names as you type into a text box because that's relatively difficult in other, um, in other, it can be difficult to do in other frameworks or, or you know, JavaScript, I should say. Um, so we have an empty list, and we have a button that says load some data, and when we load some data, we get all these uh, contacts, presumably. And the idea is that we can filter and say, um, and, and we can type in a name, and if those, or we can type in some letters, and if those two appear uh, sequentially in, anywhere in here, case insensitively, then it's gonna just show those, right? So it, it's pretty cool, because it, it demonstrates a few things. It, it demonstrates uh, the, the real-time um, aspect of, of re-rendering without losing our DOM state, which our DOM state is the fact that this field is focused and it's the position of our cursor, right? So that state's not kept in React. Uh, React doesn't know the position of your cursor or care, um, but it also ha has, but React also has its own state. So it, you know, it gets a little tricky when you have two sources of truth, and that's just a side effect of the fact that, that the DOM is a, um, th that we're kind of encapsulating the DOM's API in, in a new API. So we kind of have to do with these things. But it, you know, it's totally transparent to the program. Uh, it, so, so let's jump into the code here, and then maybe we can make a modification and, and do something cool. Um, so I'll, I'll pull up on the, the source for that, and we'll, we'll zoom in a little bit here. It's a bit bad way of zooming, but. Uh, so I've got a helper function up here. Pretty simple. Normally we would put that in some external utils file, but uh, th this just accepts some text and it accepts a list and it returns a new list with filtered by uh, only f filtering out the items that don't match the text you sent in. And if the text is empty, then it just returns a copy of the entire list. Makes sense, everybody? So slice is a shorthand way of copying an array. We're going to lowercase the text that we're searching for, and then we're going to lowercase all the items just to make sure that we can kind of get as many matches as, as we can. Um, now, uh, in this sorry, case, I'm going to... Sorry, real, real quick. Why don't you just return a list instead of just slice? Um, you know, it wouldn't make it wouldn't make any difference in this, uh, in this example, but the general policy is don't mutate the data that's passed to you. <coughs> Um, the reason is, and, and I've been burned by this a lot of times, is that if, you, if, if somebody passes your, if you have a helper function and somebody passes you an array and you mutate that array, then somewhere, somewhere in the code, they expected that array to, to have a certain thing and it doesn't, then you're gonna have a very difficult time debugging it. So um, it's just, a, I, I guess it's just a convention, it's just a habit that I have of, of never, um, yeah, ne never change, you know. If, if you, if in some cases you give them back a new list, then in all cases, could um, is filter a new ECMAScript 6 thing? Or? It's an ECMAScript 5 thing. So it's been around for a few oh, years. Okay. But as far as I know, every browser back to IE9 supports it. <clears throat> okay. So I always use Lodash for that. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think what happened at, with, with libraries like Lodash back in the day and to some extent jQuery is that we got in the habit of using these helpers for things because browsers back then didn't support it. Uh -huh. And nowadays, there's most of what we do day to day can really be done with um, stuff that the browser provides. So, uh, okay, so um, in this case, I'm calling my view app. Um, of course, app can be composed of multiple <coughs> views. In this case, we're not, um, we're not really using composition. <coughs> Although we could, that'd be a cool little adjustment we can make to this. Uh, so app has an initial state, and um, the initial state has an empty list of contacts. Uh, it has an empty filter text, which is the text that, uh, that the person presumably would type into the input. And then it has a, another list, which is the filter contacts. 
And so this is a trick that you'll kind of learn, is that uh, if, you, if you're going to filter data, if you're going to mutate some data, keep the original and also keep the, the mutated copy. Um, so that you can, so that as filter text changes, you can always generate a new filtered context from your original context, if that makes sense. Um, so we have three pieces of state, of internal state. Uh, we have a render method that says, hey, if we don't have any context at all, uh, return this no data to display, and a button that says load our data. Mm -hmm. uh, and otherwise, uh, we're gonna have a paragraph that says filter data, we're gonna have an input, and we're gonna have, um, and then a list, this, this UL list. Um, there's a couple of funky things here that I'll jump into. So this UL list has a, um, it, it's actually calling out, instead of doing all the logic right here in this main render, it, it's very helpful to call out to render helpers. And so this render helper ret uh, renders the internal contents of our UL. And um, it can return an array. So any render function besides the main render function can return an array. Uh, a, a string of text, null, meaning nothing, or a React component. So inside this render list, I've got this long line that I should probably break up. And so in this line, we're gonna, we're gonna grab the filtered contents from the state, uh, and we're going to uh, call a map, which, uh, going back to your question, is also another built-in array helper function. So a map just takes an array and returns a new array with each item mapped to a new item. So we're gonna so for every name in the filtered context, we're gonna return an li with that name as its contents. Um, ignore this key thing for now, but just know that React that anytime you give React an array, it likes to have some unique identifier in each element for the array. That's a that's kind of a re it helps React do optimizations. If I left this out, it would still work but we get a warning in our console that says, hey, um, your performance is gonna be low. But I, I don't wanna get into the internals of key, but just for now, know that anytime you return an array um, from a render function, that you should probably just put a key on there. Something that's unique to each element. Um, so uh, everybody's with me on this whole render logic, what I've done here to render the, the list. Oh, there's one other thing I wanted to go into. So our input element, I'm setting it on change, but I'm also giving it a value which this is gonna be, this may be a little weird, but this is called a, a controlled input. And by a controlled input, I mean that at all times, the state of the input lives with inside React, inside the React component. So I actually control its value at all times. Meaning when a key press happens, it fires my update filter, I do some logic, and then a render gets triggered, and then I give it its value. If I let this out, or if, or if this was an empty string, then that means no matter what I do on this list, no matter what I do here, it'll never um, update. Because I control, by I, I mean the React component, I control the value of that input at all times. What if you left the value out altogether? Uh, it would be the same thing as an empty string. Because it would be undefined and undefined is basically the same as, as uh, in, in this case, <clears throat> I believe it would also um, yeah. oh. oh, right, okay, I know why. Yeah, if I leave it out, then it assumes I don't want to control the input. Sorry, I gave you the wrong answer on that. <clears throat> There's some edge cases where you wouldn't want to control the input, but in general, you want to control the input. And the reason is, is because you only want one source of truth for the value of that tech, of that input, and that source of truth should be in our state. And by our, I mean the React component, because we need to do things like filter with that text. So, um, That'll make more sense after you start building React stuff. Like the reason why you use controlled components will make more sense. Um, behind the scenes, React does some crazy logic to make sure that that input value always stays to what you tell it does, what you tell it to be without uh, messing up your cursor and things like that. So it, it's pretty cool. Uh, okay, so render list, we went over that. The update filter is important. Actually, there's two pieces here. There's the load data, which is really simple. I have, a, I have some data that I've already specified as a global. Um, for the sake of this example, we're gonna grab the contents, contacts from that data, we'll make a copy of it, and then we're gonna sort it randomly. Um, this is just a hacky way of kind of randomly shuffling the array. Um, and then we're gonna set the state. And um, the contacts is just gonna be the, the, the contacts that I just um, that I just created or, or loaded from disk, presumably. And then the uh, filtered contacts, contacts is 
uh, calling my helper, and I'm gonna send it whatever my full text may be, which initially would be nothing, um, would be an empty string, and then I'm gonna send it, uh, send it to contacts, I just, contacts that I just generated. So <clears throat> does that load data make sense? And then of course the update filter means, so this gets called, so this does two things, right? This gets called every time um, any change happens on the input, and, and this is debalanced and handled internally so that we don't overload, you know, that we don't call this thing too many times in a row, but um, the, the idea being that it would update quick enough to, to hit 60 frames a second, but you'd never get pounded too hard on, on this to, to, to slow the whole application down. <clears throat> so all we're gonna do is, uh, so we get an event, just like a, a normal browser uh, event handler would get, and that event has a target on it, and that target is always the element that called that called the method, and then it has a, and then we can grab the value. So, so event.target is the input, is the DOM input element, and we'll just grab the value from it. And, and then we have to do two things, right? Because this function needs to update the, uh, the piece of state that cares about what our filter text is, otherwise our, if we don't update that, our input will never change. And then we also need to update the filtered contact. Uh, so we take the original contacts, and we take the text that was just typed. And I don't know, maybe I'm over explaining this. Stop me if I'm over. I have, a, I have a question. I, I think your explanation is fine. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if you do an AJAX call on one of the votes. So. That's a great <clears throat> question. So <clears throat> let's simulate an AJAX call, actually. So uh, let's pretend like data doesn't exist <clears throat> for one second. It takes us one second to go around. <clears throat> so the, the, the first thing we could do is. Um, So remember, this is our function shorthand here, and um, we want to delay it for one second. Um, so the first thing you can do is uh, you can create, uh, you, you can wait your second, and then you can update your state, right? So that means that uh, nothing is happening, uh, meaning I press a button, but I'm confused because nothing happened for a full second, and so I think maybe I should press it again. And now I've got myself, now I've got two AJAX calls going out. So this would be the naive way of doing it, right? W would be, n I should prefix that by saying, imagine set, set timeout here for one second is actually going and fetching data, right? Imagine this is a, a, an Ajax call, right? Everybody with me on that? So the naive way would be just put your logic in the return of that Ajax call. Um, but a good UI would show a loading indicator, right? <clears throat> so in order to do that, the, uh, the best way to do it is let, let's go up to our initial state and um, let's have a, is loading value. And now I can simply go down here to my render and I can say uh, if this dot state dot uh, is loading, uh, return something that's not clickable. So now they can't click it twice because while it's loading, I'm displaying some text, right? And then what I would do here is I would say, um, um, now I would say this dot set state and then when I'm done now when my data has come back I can now set three things the contacts the filters contacts and the is loading is now false because I'm done loading is that does that make sense to everybody before we see if it works so if I do this again now, it should for it should for one second say it's loading, and it did not. Is loading is true? Is false. Anybody, anybody knows any mistakes here? If this stuff state that is loading. Should I like when you change the state? Does it render out of the way? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. It does. Yeah. So so let's make the timeout like. There's something else I'm doing wrong here. There's an error in the uh, console there. How did you just, oh, good, for, uh, good call, good call. Um, <clears throat> uh, they're returning the string. Whoops. Does, are there any helper libraries to do AJAX calls? Or you just um, Rack doesn't 
it doesn't offer that much. And, and that's why it's not like a, it's not a full framework like Angular would be. Uh, it really just gives you rendering stuff, state stuff. Uh, it doesn't really concern itself with how you store your data, where you store your data, how you fetch it from the server. So what you end up doing is, when you start building real world applications, is you bring in, um, you, you, you tend to pull in libraries from NPM and using Browserify and stuff. So I, I like the fetch library, they're super agent. There's all these like Ajax and libraries that just do Ajax, right? And so fetch is a good one, it's made by GitHub and it um, emulates a future browser API that will be available to us that, that's really awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, no, the answer to your question is no, React does not do that, so I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, I, didn't, I never saw anything like that, and I was curious. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of cool, right? Like, I mean, that makes sense, how I can update state, and then I can, a second later, update it again. Um, updating state can be asynchronous, or it cannot be asynchronous, depending on what happens behind the scenes. Meaning, if um, React decides if it needs to render a frame right away, or if it can wait uh, a 60th of a second or a 30th, a 30th of a second so that it doesn't, um, clobber your performance. So things, a lot of things happen behind the scenes. Basically what I'm saying is don't immediately count. Um, so as soon as I, so if I were to console.log, I'll probably get too far into the inner workings here now, but if I were to console.log is dot uh, state uh, is <coughs> um, that would still be false. Even though I just told it up here to make it true, because this is probably going to, and by probably I mean in almost all cases except for some edge cases, this is gonna happen asynchronously. So if you really need to make something happen after your next render, you would pass in um, you would pass in a function here. But that's getting into advanced stuff, and you don't have to worry about that for now. Do we have any other questions? Because I'm out of content. <laughs> that's a, that's a really good question because I'm glad we built that because that's such a real world. How would you uh, actually a couple questions? Can I put the markup in a separate file, like I would normal templating? Yeah, so. And, <coughs> or does that have to be in the JavaScript space like that? Um, so, the way to think of your markup is that it is JavaScript. We're just writing it using a weird syntax, but it's actually JavaScript because it is rendered with JavaScript. So, but but I think the core of your question is should my views live with my logic, right? And, that's, yeah, and, sure. and that violates some principles that we all kind of know better, which is like put your business logic and your views um, apart. So the answer is yes, you should use different files for that. You should, um, you, you, your view stuff, which is describing a lot of like complex class names and all that, that should, it, it, yes, it will be in JS classes, I mean, it will be in JS in React classes, but it should live in a different directory or in different files. So you can still have like a button <coughs> folder with different button yes. templates. It's just using, exactly. And then you, it's not just raw HTML, it's got right. JSX. Yeah, it's got JSX, and it might have some very simple logic, if, if then else stuff in there, but it's, you know, your Ajax fact fetching should probably not live alongside of your is button pressed or not logic, right? Mm -hmm. so. so you use um, on clicks on your button. How yes. hard do you do to make the user understand the head hand or something? So behind the scenes it does. And the reason why we specify it this way is because the React needs to um, <clears throat> it needs to parse out our, our listeners, aggregate them, and put them levels above on the dot. So really what it's doing is, because I might have a list of, okay, let's say I had an on-click on each one of these, right? But there's hundreds of these things, right? I don't want to, for performance reasons, you know, those of us who've been in the JS world, world for a while know that for performance reasons, you don't add an on-click handler onto every single element in a 200 element list, right? You add it to the parent list, um, and then you use delegation so that when a click happens and it bubbles up, you catch it and you figure out which element was actually originally fired the event, and then you do that. So that's the beauty of React being this, like, big layer of abstraction away from the DOM is that it does it for us. So um, in our code, yes, we put it on, we, we always put it on the element that we care about. And in React abstraction layers, it figures out where is ideal to put it and puts it way up, probably on the DOM. Would it, does it work well with like uh, external code base of like jQuery or whatever? They wanted to add additional event handlers to the button, would that work out? Or? Um, it, it, it would probably be okay, but here's what you would want to do in that case. Um, you want uh, you want React to own the container that it renders into completely, meaning nobody else touches it. So it's fine if jQuery runs your entire page, your entire application, but you've got this list that was really slow in jQuery because it's got a thousand names on it. You've got this really cool 
React table thing that does some fancy scroll logic where it only shows the ones that are in the view and it does all this really cool optimization for performance, you want React to own that <coughs> container. So by the container, here's what I mean. Anytime you call react.render, you must pass two things. You must pass a React component um, and, you, and you have to pass a container. And in this case, in all of our examples, our container has just been our document.body because we're, we have trivial examples. But in real life, you might have just one piece of the page, one div, and that would be the container. So you want React to own that and everything inside of it, and don't let jQuery touch it, because <coughs> React needs to make some assumptions that when it changed some state, when it comes back to it later, that it is in the state that it left it. And you could, you could do one piece of the page, <coughs> At a time, Just, you don't have to rewrite the whole thing almost. Yeah, and, and that's one of the beauties of React not being a huge monolithic library. It really um, it really is a view, a, a piece of view, meaning you can have a much bigger application and, and have one piece that's React and have everything else angular. So and people good. have done that. So it's good for microservices. <laughs> I think so too, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I like to think of the unbundling of things that's happening and um, one of the things that's, that's happening is we're unbundling things like jQuery and we're using small libraries, small micro libraries for different things. And, you know, I don't want to call React a micro library. It's not all that tiny, but it really does one thing and it does it really well. Which goes back to our slide, which is that slide that shows, you know, pass a data to a render function and it puts it in and puts it in the DOM kind of thing. That, that's how you can think of React. <clears throat> How would you react to a right click? Is you have the, the JavaScript you've been or is there a There's probably a um, there's probably a, a property a built-in property for that. All in context then. It is. Let's see what happens. Do we have anything here that needs a click with or a button? Yeah, that doesn't feel right. <coughs> Is right. <laughs> Prevent default. You don't want the menu to check. Good call. Which we can totally do. That's actually a great example of something we should do right here. So um, uh, it, it does some um, similar to how jQuery glosses over some browser differences. React does the same thing. So I can I'm guaranteed that event has a um, prevent default even if I'm in IE8, which does not natively support that because React is smart enough to know, hey, I'm in IE8, give me a synthetic event that has this function on it. So, um, so yeah, that's exactly right. Awesome. Can you show us an example when you render the list with React animation tools? I'm very curious how animations work. Yeah, that's probably beyond the scope of this. It would be it would be it would be a non-trivial thing to do, I think, um, to, to do right now. But but I'll I'll say this: um, there's more than one way to do it. Um, there's a lot of helper libraries out there. But the simplest way would be to have a to have to put something in your state here that says old position and new position of an element, right? So we so we'd factor out these li's, we'd factor out these um, these list items here. We'd factor those into some other class, uh, to a React component, and that React component would have state, and it would be my current location relative to the view or relative to the body, and then whenever it changes, we'd have to attach something to listen to when that changes, and then we'd have to use an easing function and figure out where to go in between. Um, it's a lot of work, right? But there's libraries that are written to help you with that stuff. So there's a lot of different animation libraries out there. Um, React does not excel at animation, um, and the reason is because animation has transient state, right? It has the state of your application, and then it has this kind of temporary state of, um, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm working on it, and I'll be there in a second sort of thing. And so there's a few different ways to do that transient state, and um, and if you and if you look up some helper libraries, I can post some links to that um, that, will, uh, that will answer your question better than what I'm saying. So what about internationalization? You're just templating filter data into templates and then using that for internationalization? Um, or how, how does react that's a good question. So. Um, I, I don't know if I can say that there's one standard way to do it, but here's how we do it at work, right? Uh, anytime that I would put uh, something like this into the DOM, I would wrap it in another component. Um, and not the button I meant to press, but that's okay. Um, 
so ours should be called IT, which would be Facebook Translate. And, uh, and, and this component would be run through um, an internationalization library at compile time. And, and it would be statically changed to whatever language the, the viewer context is in. Uh, so, uh, you know, other people would probably do something, um, other companies would probably have a T function. I don't know why T, but, but T or underscore T seems to be the thing that people in the world use. So it might be like this. It's shorter. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> So you do something like that, and um, and so I, I guess the idea behind this like T function call would be that it, it would be maybe be done at runtime. Uh, we do ours at compile time, but I mean that's um, you know internationalization is not an easy problem, and the reason is is because you have to deal with things like ordinals, right? So we would say um, uh, thank you for joining Facebook. You've achieved your first <coughs> rank. Well, first is something that you know one st is something that we have in our language, but in other languages they would right. It changes the whole format. Changes things, you know, like commas and dots and um, things like that. So um, it gets a little more complicated than this, but that's the gist of it. Is that anytime you type an English word in your content, that you need to wrap it in something, and some manual person at some somewhere in the world um, looks at it and translates it. And like French, the word for upload and download is the same word. <laughs> yeah, we dealt with that at PayPal a lot. Yeah. The, the, the linguist, because it was a big deal there when I was there, and they always said, well, I can't say that in German. It's just like, it's like, it's like, it's like it's true, and then you get really the CSS layout problems, right? Yeah, so like, I made a button that says submit, and then in German it's like this huge long word, um, and then <coughs> now, I've, now I've got overlapping text and all this stuff, so Prior to Flexbox, that was really difficult to do. Um, it's a little bit easier now because we can um, specify layout without floats. Um, and, and Flexbox is IE 10 and up. If you get a chance to, to completely switch topics into CSS, if you get a chance to use Flex, Flexbox, do it. And now is a great time to do that because IE 8 and 9 have both dropped below 1% global usage, which means that Google and a few of us um, have, and, and this is like data that's as recent as a month or two ago. So a lot of us are going to drop IE8 and 9. And as soon as Google and Facebook and a few of the big guys do it, that means everybody can kind of just go nuts. And then we can use awesome things like um, file upload progress bars and, you know, Flexbox and stuff like that. I was, I was curious, uh, maybe if you uh, just go with this part, maybe later touch on it if you can. But um, uh, what your thoughts are on the Flex architecture and if it's worth going all out with that, or if you just dropping this in as the V in your stack or whatever already mm -hmm. is what the ups and downs are of, of that. So um, when you build an application from scratch, yes, go with Flux. That's what I would say. And, and Flux is a, it's a way of dispatching events and updating data stores and it's a whole other talk, right? And it took me a while to understand why Flux is significant compared to any other way of storing data. But the way it works is, if you start a new project, um, so if you have an existing project that, that that question doesn't count, right? You need to use what you're already using. If you start a new project, you have one or two things. You can just start building your own stuff, right? Building your own data stores, key value pairs, and any more into things that have event listeners in it. Before you know it, you're using helper functions and helper functions, and you, and you find that listening for data changes um, need to update state. And that um, the way you update state is that, um, that you need to pass a new object each time. So you end up going down a path of immutable objects. And by immutable objects, I mean that you have this deeply nested object or array, one value in it changes, and now I'm gonna pass you a brand new object that's a copy of that with one item changed. Um, there are ways to optimize for that so that um, immutability can give you huge performance gains um, for deeply nested structures. If you're just changing one thing somewhere deep down there because Many of the objects don't have their actual continuums, things like that. But um, the short answer is yes, it's worth it's worth using that. And the reason I can say that with certainty isn't because um, I've drank the Kool Aid and we use it at work. Um, it's because other companies who started using React have decided to build things that are so similar to Flux that it seems like a natural progression to go. So Yahoo is flexible, which is open source and awesome. Cool. <clears throat> I think that's um, most of the 
mostly what I have. Uh, this is, um, you know, if you're not convinced about how awesome it is, these are the people who are, who are using React. Uh, Netflix did some amazing stuff with React. Um, they just have so much money to put into engineering. They built their own, I mean, I guess most of the big companies do, but they built their own uh, fork of Chromium inside televisions. So if you buy a new Samsung TV, it'll have this version of React in there that's been forked and built from scratch to run on a television so that they can watch Netflix on your TV. Uh, Airbnb has done some cool stuff. PayPal just jumped on the bandwagon two weeks ago. Uh, Yahoo is building their- No, Sam, I thought they had their, what was their framework, Kraken or something? That's Walmart. Is that Walmart? No, that's PayPal. Is it PayPal? I think it's PayPal. Oh, right. That's more of like a- Walmart attack. It's, it's more of a what? It's a service side thing? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's the same thing. So it's a service side. Yeah, it's, it's like, like an express competitor. I think they were still doing a bunch of boiler plates. Right, stuff. okay, right. okay. Right. Walmart has Happy. That's the one that's also- Yeah, Happy JS. Right. Um, yeah, PayPal just recently jumped on the bandwagon. Yahoo's building their entire, they're rebuilding Yahoo Mail in it. I think that's almost done. Um, oh, wow. They're rebuilding Yahoo that's Finance great. in React, um, which I think is their money maker. Uh, BBC is using it, Pinterest. Uh, Instagram is, is owned by Facebook and WhatsApp is owned by, by Facebook, but um, but it's not, that's not the reason why they chose to use it, I think. Because we don't, well, because at work, in, in, you have a lot of latitude as, as developers, so you don't have to use one particular thing. You can use what you want to, and especially if you're WhatsApp, because WhatsApp was, um, they run completely separately from the rest of Facebook and they chose to use React. So. And, and so this image here is the new messenger.com in, which is completely in React, and it's like a full-blown messenger interface, and it's super, uh, it, it feels super responsive, what we're doing, so. That's, that's, that's the web version what of is like a React Native thing. That's, that's that is the, is, that is the web, uh, that's messenger.com. Messenger.com. That is messenger.com, which is bought by Facebook, and they launched this brand new, rewritten, fully in React version of Messenger. The idea is that if you go to facebook.com to check one message, you're gonna get distracted by, your timeline with like some kick-ass video on it that auto starts playing and then these ads that you absolutely must click on because they're awesome too, right? And then you're never gonna get your message checked and you will have bought some cool new toy, right? And, uh, but if you go to messenger.com, you'll get that message checked and you didn't get distracted. So that's um, that's what we have. And uh, that, that's me and my, my new little dude who's a future React coder. And, um, and you can, uh, so what I'll do is, I will uh, post links to these slides and I will post this demo code on Twitter. Because Twitter is more suitable for this stuff than Facebook. Do Don't you repeat have, that. Do you have <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, Cut that out of the video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what were you saying? Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.